Good afternoon. Isn't it, be, isn't it good to be in the hiring mode again? It's something that uh, not a lot of people were asking about the last few years. So before we jump in, though, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank MRAA um, and you all um, for inviting Spader Business Management back um, to present some of the lessons we've learned from many of you dealers. And I'd like to start actually with a, a little bit of a success story from someone who's used the principles and practices that we're about to talk about for the next hour and a half. This is uh, from an email I received. A gentleman said, we, this is a general manager of a dealership, and he said, we've been struggling to get good tech service writers and good employees overall. How many does that sound familiar to? Okay, we had recently built a new facility with a total of eight service bays and could not seem to find good techs to fill it or other people. Of the ones we did hire, a large percent did not work out. How many does this still sound familiar to? Okay. So after using some of these principles, I called him a couple years later. He said, while there, I learned how to interview properly to find out if this really is the right person before we hire them, not afterwards. Since attending that training, I've hired a service manager, three service writers, two lot porters, and seven techs. It's been two years, and they have all worked out fantastically. Our service manager truly manages the entire department. The service writers are the best I've ever had, and our techs are achieving excellent collectible efficiencies and quality of work. Our numbers have almost doubled from our previous peak, and my involvement in the department's day-to-day -day operations have gone from excessive to non-existent as the general manager. Even in the height of the busy season, our service department is able to say yes to servicing everyone's coach, no matter where they bought it. Most of our new employees, and this is important, most of these new employees came from other industries but already had some transferable skills, characteristics, abilities, and the adaptability that allowed them to migrate to our industry with ease. Okay, as a matter of fact, they, got, they have gotten so good at hiring, I talked to them a few years, uh, a few years after that again, actually it's about five years, they had hired 44 people, 81.8%, if you want to be exact, of them one year later, he said, were some of the highest performing employees we had in our dealership. And they now have a preference for hiring outside of the industry because they want to teach them how to think about their industry. And so they have moldable clay. And so those are some of the things we're going to talk about and some of those skill sets that you all can take away from this. Now, several of you, not quite everybody, but hopefully most of you have a little keypad there. So this is something we hear a lot. I'd like everyone, as soon as that little light turns green, to go ahead and answer. Just press one, two, or three on your keypad. What, do you agree, disagree, or you're unsure about the statement, people are our most important asset? Okay, so we've got several responses. Let's go ahead and see what we think. All right, 98% agree that people are your most important asset. I see this is, we're, we're going to start off on a different viewpoint. I don't believe that statement. We have to qualify it. How many of you have hired somebody and thought it may have been the worst decision you ever made related to your business? All people are not your most important asset. The right people are. Okay, so that finding the right people will take a little extra time, it will take a little extra energy, and it will take a little extra effort, but it will be worth it, and we'll show you many of the, the benefits of that in just a minute. So we want to qualify that. One of the, one of the individuals that, that led a great organization in developing a lot of people and leaders was, was um, Jack Welch at GE. One of the things he liked to do is say there's four types of employees, and this is what we need to figure out, these types, four types of employees, how to get the right ones in our organization and those that aren't to get them out. The first type, he said, were really easy. He said, those that don't produce, don't hit their numbers, and they're not in alignment with our company's culture. He said, that's very easy. You redeploy them into the workforce to find a place where they can be more productive and satisfied. Okay? And you do that quicker rather than later. The second type are also very easy. Those are, the, those, are those that are, hit their numbers. They're high producers, but also have high values alignment. They reflect your company's culture. Do everything you can to reward them 
Make them satisfied in their job. Help them find more things that they enjoy while they're in your workforce. So the next ones are a little bit tougher. Those that aren't hitting their numbers, but they're doing a good job. They fit our culture, or they're, but they're not quite producing what we need them to do. They fit with our culture, they're, they're trying, then within a reasonable amount of time, we want to help develop them, train them, get them up to speed. If they can't, then we will help them find another job. Because it was our, it was our mistake if we brought them into our organization and put them in a role where they couldn't perform. That's on us, so we have an obligation within reason to help them find another, another position. Said, so in the last type were the ones that we realized were the, were the cancer in our organization and we'd never be a high performing organization or excellent or well respected until we figured out that these were the biggest cancer. And that were those that hit their numbers, so they produce a lot but did not reflect our company's culture. Okay, and he said those were the we found that those were the people that were holding us back. Why? Because if they didn't fit with our company's culture, what were we then? Oftentimes we were a hypocrite, right? We're saying one thing, we're all about values, unless you hit these numbers, in which case we let you do some other things. How many have had those individuals in your organization before? One of those superstars you're terrified to lose because they have so much revenue, but they drive everyone else nuts and crazy. How many of you regret letting that person go? Okay, I've asked well over 10,000 people, I've seen less than 20 hands go up, which means 90, roughly 99.9% .9 of the time, we're better off. We never regret it, so why do we wait? Okay, that fear holds us back. But 99.9% .9 is pretty good, pretty good likelihood, right? That we're gonna be okay? All right, so let's bring this back to hiring. Within the hiring process, how do you know whether you have an effective hiring process or not? whether you can put people in those categories before their first day of work. Okay, you use, some of the, you use the tools that we're gonna show you here, you can get to a better than an 80% likelihood of being able to do that. That's how you know when you have effective hiring practices. When you can do that with, an, with eight out of 10 people on a consistent basis. And you'll, you'll have another um, worksheet a little bit farther back that looks at this, but essentially we're looking for three fits. Anytime we bring someone into our organization, we're looking for three fits. And if you wanna write this on the inside front cover there, um, be helpful to repeat it so we remember it. The first one is our culture and values fit. Do they fit with the way we do business around here? The keynote speaker did a good job talking about that. Okay, if you, they don't fit with the environment, not every organization is for every person. I'm guessing there are a lot of people at, at WestJet, like he, as he talked about, are there are a lot of people that wouldn't enjoy that loose culture. Okay, as a matter of fact, I know that's the case. They find that with Southwest as well. Okay, and you know what happens? They remove those people right away. But the bottom line is, I don't care how great of a performer they are. I don't care how many capabilities they have. I don't care what kind of numbers they're gonna put up unless they fit with our company's culture. And why is that? Let's see a show of hands. How many of you would agree one person can significantly influence the entire environment of your dealership. Absolutely. So why in the world would we ever bring someone in who can negatively affect everybody else in our dealership, regardless of what numbers they put up? We see this in sports all the time, right? We see a superstar get a disproportionately huge salary package. And what happens in a lot of those cases? Do they, are they on teams, especially the ones that are more me-oriented? Do those teams ever make the championship? Very rarely. Okay, so we know it's, it's limited if we're really looking for excellence. So the first fit, always culture. They don't fit our culture, it doesn't matter how capable they are. Culture first and always. The second fit then is performance. Can they do the job? Can they do that job at a high level? Or there are times when we see the raw potential and we say, can they do the job? at a high level in the near future with the right development and training. They've got the right core attributes, motivations, and capabilities. They may just need a little extra industry knowledge and they'll be off and running. And then the last one becomes critically important for long-term performance and success. And that's the satisfaction fit. Is this something they're going to be passionate about long-term? One of the challenges we have now is that so many People coming into the workforce have so many capabilities, they can do lots of things. The trick is helping them find what they're passionate about. 
again, we can do that with a, a better than an 80% certainty when we're using the right tools and the right interview methodologies. So culture first, performance second, satisfaction third. We need to have all three or it's simply not going to work. If you have someone who's high performing, but they're not satisfied, they have the capabilities of doing that. I can relate to that. I took accounting courses in college. Okay. Personally, I'd rather slam my hand in a car door than do accounting for an entire day. I did very well at it, I was capable, but I won't be very satisfied. Okay, so capabilities and performance do not equal satisfaction and long-term performance. What, long-term success. What we know about that as well is even the most adaptable individual will only be able to keep their energy up to perform well for two years. After that, they burn themselves out. Highly capable, if it's not a good satisfaction fit. So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna put you to work for, for the next couple minutes. Work, go ahead and work with a partner or someone right next to you. And I would like you to just make your best, quick best guess. And let's make the assumption. What's the, we're gonna take a, make the assumption that we lost a good salesperson and we have to replace them, replace them with someone newer. Okay, so we can't replace the, that same level, so we're losing a good solid salesperson. We need to replace them with someone who's, who's not as good of a performer, but we feel like they have the potential, but they're a newer, newer salesperson. What could that, what's the true cost of that to our organization? Okay, I'm gonna have you go through and, and add those up. I'm gonna give you about two minutes, so work quickly. I know everyone has a smartphone, you can grab your calculator there. So go ahead and complete this. Our assumptions again are we're losing a good solid salesperson, replacing them with someone with less experience. Again, don't worry about it, this being perfect. This is just meant to be an exercise to get us thinking about it. What's the difference? So year one, how much less volume would an would a, a inexperienced salesperson sell than a good seasoned salesperson? Okay, so that's what we're looking for. In year two, how much less? Would they be fully up to speed or not? Usually it takes a couple years before they really get, before they really get going. Oftentimes, we look at the next one, less margin. Oftentimes, less experienced salespeople give away a little extra margin. Okay, how much is that? What would that do? Uh, uh, what, how much, what percent less margin? What does that do? I'll give you about another 30 seconds, then we'll, we'll look at the ranges we came up with.
Okay, wherever you are, go ahead and add up what you have. I realize I maybe didn't give you quite enough time, but usually at this point someone asks to stop anyway because it's starting to get painful. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to hear, just shout out, what are, what are some of the numbers you came up with? Again, this will vary depending on what type of boats you're selling, um, depending on what your dealership is. There are a lot of different factors here. But what were some of the numbers you came up with? Thousand, three hundred thousand. Three thirty, two forty, two fifty eight. 180, 99, okay, those are real numbers. Now, here are a few other numbers we've had dealers, um, dealers like yourself calculate when we had a little bit more time. So impossible, four employees could easily cost us two to $400,000 in lost revenue. Now, one of the reasons I ask is how many of you really get excited about hiring? How many of you feel like you truly devote the time, energy, and effort necessary to truly get the best person for the job? Okay. I appreciate the honesty. Is it worth two to four hundred thousand dollars to maybe do a little extra if you have the right tools? How many would like that? Add two to four hundred thousand to the bottom line? Okay, that's your new motivator. Not do I like doing interviews, not do I like meeting and talking to all these people and looking at all these fun resumes. That's not the real question. The question is, if we're making $50,000, even if it's $10,000 decisions, most of us are going to spend a little bit more time thinking about it. So start thinking about it that way. I'm making decision that could be a hundred to a two hundred to a three hundred thousand dollar decision. What do I have to do to educate myself so I don't make that mistake? That's how important the hiring process should be prioritized by effective leaders. Effective leadership is about getting the right people on the team and leading them. You don't have the right people on the team, it's pretty tough. Your number, Jack Welch said his number one job was finding talent. Not strategy, not processes. His number one job was finding talent because he knew he couldn't do it on his own. I think there's a lesson for all of us in that. So now let's think about this as well. As soon as that goes green, I'm going to ask you to, to respond here. All right, how much time do you typically take to prepare for interviews? Okay, choice one for those of you that are, are behind the podium here, 15 minutes, zero to 15 minutes, choice two, 16 to 30, choice three, 31 to 60, choice four, one to two hours, and choice five, two or more hours. All right, we've got several responses there. We'll go ahead and see what our results are. Okay, so 65% of us are thir under 30 minutes, excuse me, 64 percent, and 90 percent an hour or less. How many two to three hundred thousand dollar decisions do you usually make in an hour or less in any other facet of life? Why in the world would we do it when we're bringing people on that can have that much impact on our business? We didn't even talk about if you get the wrong person and they, they make a bunch of other people mad and they leave or they make a bunch of other people mad and reduce their performance by 10 or 20 or 30 percent, then those numbers are, e are even more conservative. All right, so let's talk a little bit about hiring criteria here. What, looking at those tools that we have at our disposal to get the right people in. By the way, this is in your, the next page in your work, workbook. It's on the bottom, right, right, excuse me, not the next page, right under, underneath that exercise we just did. So I'm just going to have you shout out some answers here. So if we were to hire someone based solely on their education, what percentage of the time do you think we'd get the best, best person for the job? Based solely on their education. Less than 10, 20%. Anyone hiring 20%? Just we'll see how, how good all those college dollars are for us. 10%. Good number, roughly 10% if we hire people just based solely on their education. How about if we look at their resume? 
We're based solely on their resume. What percentage of the time do you think we'll get the best person for the job? Five? Went down? 30? Now, we definitely do have to be careful. Um, it's estimated between right around 30 to 35 percent of all resumes have an outright lie on them. Not an exaggeration, but it's beyond truthful in the results that they put, so we have to be careful about those. Good resource, but 16 percent. Okay, so helpful, and we'll talk a little bit later about how they can be extremely helpful in the interview process if we use them effectively. Okay, but we just don't take, uh, take what's on there for gospel truth, that's for sure. Traditional one-on-one -on -one interview, where we bring someone in, we look at their education, their resume, look at their experience, bring them in, ask our 10 or 15 or 20 favorite questions that we have, start selling them on the job and how great of a dealership we are so that they come and join us. What do you think? What percentage of the time do we get the best person from the job out of a pool of candidates? Now you're several saying around 20? Close, 19%. So one in five now, getting a little bit better than rolling dice. Rolling dice might be a, a good idea for some people. I actually did have one client who said, well, actually, you know, you know, I hire based on zip code. What do you think of that? Well, that's an interesting criteria I hadn't heard about. Uh, why do you hire by zip code? He said, well, I hire by zip code because one day I was looking through my employee files and I realized all my best employees were from the same, same zip code. So I honestly quit doing interviews. He said, I get a resume if they were from that, that, uh, from that zip code, I'd offer them a job. You know what the sad part is? My hiring success went up. So when I actually talked to people, my decision rate was worse. All right, so we were able to improve a little bit on that, but that was, uh, that was one of the more interesting factors I had heard. How about reference checks, if you can get them? I know they're getting more and more challenging. Several different numbers. 25% if you can get them. We're actually, they are helpful. You generally don't want to use ones they've given to you. Um, you'll want to contact um, other, other, their employers, et cetera, instead of using written ones that they give you. Ability or aptitude testing. So this is putting actual simulations, et cetera, in front of them. What do you think? Testing their capability. Skills test. 50, pretty darn close. 54%. Work sample performance testing, 55. So right in that same range. At least now we're flipping a coin. We're not rolling a die. So we're moving, we're moving in the right direction. Now one of the reasons why it's only roughly 50% is because we're only looking at capabilities. We're not looking at motivation. How many of you know someone who has phenomenal capabilities but is kind of lazy? <laughs> yeah, so they'll ace that, right? They'll ace a capability test, but it doesn't tell us anything about their motivation. Professional assessment center is about 59%. By the way, there's a huge amount of variation in those. Some are really good, some aren't. But in general, they tend to be a little bit better. Okay, and how about behavior-based targeted interviews? Yep, someone noticed the trend. That will be the highest. 80 plus percent, you can consistently, consistently get 80 plus percent. So what's that tell us about what we should be learning about educating ourselves, getting good at? Pretty clear here, right? By a wide margin. Now, we still use some of those other tools, assessments, et cetera, but within that behavior-based targeted interviews. You know what the best thing about behavior-based targeted interviews? When you learn how to do them, there's not much cost to them. Okay, you get good at it. There's not a lot of cost, and you can replicate it and get the best person for the job. One of the key words there is targeted, though. There's a lot of stuff out there on behavior-based interviews, and you have to target it to the right factors. So we're going to talk about, and we're gonna, we'll go through these one at a time. You have them in your worksheet there, one at a time. The five steps to the hiring and developing winner's process. So the first one is de defining the job or the job analysis. Why does the job exist? Step two then is we look at what are the factors that predict performance. So what are the capabilities and motivators to achieve what we need to have done? We can't do that until we know what the job is. One of the things that we found is that what's called a service manager in dealerships varies extremely widely. Okay, so until I know exactly what that person's doing, I can't tell you what we need to look at to hire that person. Then, once we have those, only now can we target our interview questions to assess the candidate and use some additional assessments. There are a wide variety of assessments that can be very helpful, but that's step three. Step four, 
then is if we've done our job, we should, before they start work on day one, we should have a development plan written for them. That's how you know you're doing a good job, when you can write a person's development plan before they come on board. If you can't figure that out, you shouldn't be making a hiring decision. And if you think they're perfect, you miss something. Bradford Smart does hiring for Fortune, Fortune 100 companies for key executive roles. He said he will not make a hiring decision for an executive of a Fortune 100 company unless he can find a minimum of three major weaknesses. Because if he can't find a minimum of three major weaknesses, he knows he missed something. He said everybody's human. Okay. All right, and lastly then, looking at that strategic position and succession planning. What roles might they be ready for the future? You do a good job. We were at, I was asked to help interview and hire um, a director of service role in a large dealership. Had, we had two candidates, got down to the final two. We got done with one, said definitely not a fit. Started looking at that. And we said, hey, that's interesting, though. It's not fit for the director of, of uh, service role, but if we look at his capabilities and we compare that to a director of parts role, it's actually a really good fit. Excuse me, it was, it was, it was, look, he, was hired, he was interviewing for the director of sales, not service. Been in sales his entire life. We called him back and said, I'm sorry, you were a, a good candidate, but you weren't the best candidate for the director of sales. However, we think you're a great candidate for the director of parts. And he said, what? You're a great candidate for the director of parts. We'd like to offer you that position. I've never worked in parts, my, parts and accessories my entire life. That's all right. We know you'll be good at it. He was taken aback. He said, I need to think about this. I've been in sales my entire life. We were able to identify a better fit. Two years later, we talked to him again. He said, this is the best job I've ever had. I actually like coming to work now. Everything I was doing in my other job, now I see why I had some success, but not a lot. I was doing all the stuff I didn't really, that didn't have a lot of impact. Okay, so we can actually find sometimes when we're good at this, we've had that happen internally to our company. Someone will apply for one job, we interview them, we get done, we look at it and say, they're not a good candidate for this job, we have another job opening that they'd be great for. What percentage of organizations do you think are good at that? If you're one of those that is, what kind of strategic advantage does that give to you? To be able to fit people that well? Huge. Is it worth a little extra time, energy, and effort on our part to not only make sure we save that 100, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars we talked about our cost of turnover, but also have that strategic advantage of getting those people and putting them in seats that no one else has seen how to do before? Absolutely. Okay, so let's take a look at our step one, our job analysis. So why does the job exist? Most people would call this a job description. We call it, want to say it's more than just a description. We want you to do more than list a bunch of tasks that people have to do. And I like to ask this first question here when we're looking at work direction. So job analysis is about being clear what our work expectations are. And so I would like you to, to answer this right now. How confident are you that your employees would have the same number one work priorities as, as you do? So if I were to ask them, what's your number one work priority? And I were to ask you, what's their number one work priority? How confident are you that they would have the same answer? Okay, we'll give you about another five to 10 seconds. We'll see what the audience thinks here. Okay, the first one is, uh, thank you. How confident are you that the employees would have the same number one work priority as you? Number one is I bet my life on it. Number two is I bet my job on it. And number three is I'm not betting. And for hiring, this is absolutely critical. I constantly get calls from people that say, hey, I need to hire somebody. I say, okay, what's their job? They'll give me a title. Okay, what's that mean? What are some of the duties? What's the most important aspect of their job? I don't know. I just need somebody to run service. Okay, that can mean a lot of different things. I can't go anywhere until we've identified this. So let's see here. What are we betting? No one's betting their life, 12% betting their job, and 88% say I'm not taking that bet. All right, here's something that's really important. Those of you that selected number two, excuse me, those of you that said I'm not betting, you actually selected number two. 
you are betting your job on it. Because if you're the manager and leader of your organization, people are making priorities based on something. And if it's not coming from you, what's it coming from? They're doing what's in front of them, what's in front of them, what's easiest, what they like most, or something else. So half of all performance, latest research I saw said 46% across organizations of non-performance in organizations is a lack of clear work direction. We haven't clearly identified what's most important to employees to do. They can't tell you what their number one most important work priority is. That says something, doesn't it? If our employees can't tell us their single most important work priority that has the most value to helping our dealership be successful. So step one, we have to have that. Bringing new people on, it's absolutely critical that we're clear about what that is, because I don't know how to hire for that until I know what that number one work priority is. So in doing this, this also helps us understand just quickly why employees don't do what they're supposed to do. And a lot of times it's the result of ineffective work direction. We haven't been clear about what's expected of them. The number one reason they don't do what they're supposed to do is they don't know what they're supposed to do. Okay, it hasn't been clearly told, right? Most of us just said, we're not going to take that bet. We just said the exact same thing as far as priorities go. They know it's somewhere in their list of priorities. The worst I ever saw was a six-page job description with over 75 tasks. Do you think that really helps them make decisions on a daily basis? No. Okay, second most reason, common reason employees don't do what they're supposed to do, and this will be in the slides that are available, is that they don't know how to do it. No one's taking the time to truly coach them. Just last week, one of my colleagues said, David, i got to share this with you, knowing what you do. Um, but I just uh, had a conversation with the father and their son. And uh, they were having trouble keeping employees. No, nobody was meeting their expectations or performing well. And I asked, well, did you give them any direction? He said, absolutely, we gave them direction the first day on the job. Then we let them go do their thing. They didn't take time to show them how to do it. Third most common reason employees don't do what they're supposed to do is they don't know why they should do it. No one's taking the time to explain why it's important. We know, I'm guessing one of the challenges you all have is with the youngest generation coming in when you hire them, you just have a hard time, you have a hard time um, kicking them out of the office three and four hours, or out of the dealership three and four hours after regular work hours, right? They got that strong work ethic, they want to be there the entire time? No? Okay, here's, here's something that's interesting with them. They will work very hard, they're very adaptable, can be extremely efficient. No, they don't want to work as many hours as the rest of us are, are used to or willing to do, but they can oftentimes produce just as much, if not nor, more, if not more, in less time. Okay, so don't think about it hours, think about it as results. Second thing is they want to be a part of something. One of the single greatest things that they're thinking about is I want to be a part of something bigger than me, just a paycheck. If you're just providing a paycheck and a place to work, they're not going to stick around very long and they're not going to put a lot of extra time, energy, and effort in. If you do, you help them understand why it might be important to refill the coffee after they take the last cup. Why it's important to pick up the garbage when you're walking the lot. Some of those things are common sense to most of us. But how many of you would agree common sense isn't very common? Okay, so our job as leaders is to take people where, they, where they're not going by themselves. So bring them along, help them understand why. They also think they are doing it. So they haven't gotten good feedback. We see that all the time. Three, there's four types of feedback, positive, negative, neutral, and none. Which one's the most destructive to employee performance? None. So we need to be giving them that feedback on a regular basis. Employees would actually rather have negative feedback than no feedback at all. Fifth is their obstacles beyond their control. Six is they don't think it'll work. Seven is they think their way is better. So why employees don't do what they're supposed to do. Personally, I think six and seven are absolutely great. I have employees tell me it's not going to work or they think they have a better way to skin the cat. I should be ecstatic. Why? Because they're doing what? They're thinking. What's the last thing we don't want them to do? Not think. So if they're thinking, that's great. We should be encouraging that, recognizing that, thanking them for doing that. Even if, and then if, what if they're wrong? What if they truly don't understand what's going on? Is that good or bad? That's great. Because now I have a chance to redirect them in a way and help them think about the situation at a deeper level so they're more engaged and understand more of the cause and effect. I wouldn't know about it if they, I wasn't approachable enough. So if they're coming to me and I have that chance to coach them, that's wonderful. I love that. That's just a way to elevate their performance. Okay, so now when we're doing that job analysis and coming back, why does the 
position exists. The first, I'm going to give you two options. One is the way we like to do it. It takes a little more time, energy, and effort, but if you're under a time crunch, I'm also going to give you the quick version. Okay, so the first one is the kind of the full-blown version. We call them job tracks. And the first thing we start with are key result areas. They're the two to five most important results for each position. Okay, so every job, these are outcomes. The reason why the job exists. To achieve what? These are not tasks. These are not 30, 40, 50, 60 tasks. These are the outcomes or the results. So oftentimes we have laundry lists of job descriptions that have 15, 20, 30 different tasks, but why do you do all that? To achieve what? It's amazing how many employees and even managers can't answer that. I don't know, I just know you have all these things you have to do. So how do I know whether I'm winning or losing the game? What two to five results or outcomes? Focus on the results, not the tasks or duties. And those must be prioritized and weighted. So some things are a heck of, how many of you would agree some aspects of people's jobs are way more important than other aspects? Okay, a good example of that um, in a little bit different area of life is anniversary. Our, for those of, how many people are married? For those, of, for those of you that are married, your anniversary date is 1 365th of the year. Does it have 1 365th significance if you happen to forget that day? No, time does not equal impact. Some things are a lot more important than others. Okay, so here's an example of a sales manager. Three results, profit management, inventory management, and people management. Okay, now you'll see on the far right there, we actually put an impact percent on there. 50%, 30%, 20%. Maybe you, it's different in your dealership. We developed this using high performers. We think it's pretty good for most dealerships, but not every dealership's exactly the same. Now, what's that do? Right away, it tells me which role is most important or which result is most important. Now, this isn't sequence either. You could argue that maybe I need to be a good people manager and inventory manager in order to achieve profit management, but let me ask you this question right now. Uh, sales manager A, his name is Joe. Joe always hits his numbers. He gets his inventory out of whack every now and then, but he figures his way how to sell out of it and hit his, hit his number at the end of the year almost every single year. And he's an okay people manager. That's Joe. Let's look at Bob. Bob's great at managing people. Develops them, works with them, coaches them, excellent. He's okay at managing it. He's also okay at managing his inventory. Or let's even say his inventory is flawless. Okay, but he only occasionally hits his budget number at the end of the year. How many of you take the first manager, Joe, hits his numbers? How many take Bob, the good people manager with impeccable inventory that doesn't hit his numbers? Let me ask again, how many want Joe now? Clarified? Ab absolutely, because that's the number one most important result, especially in this industry. You're not selling nothing, nothing else happens. True or not true? True. Okay, so we better be selling, we better be doing it at the right margin, generating enough revenue to keep the dealership going. That's our number one most important result area. So now there are three things, it's pretty clear. Now when I go to evaluate, Joe, at the end of each year, I'm evaluating essentially on those three things. I don't have to evaluate. Now, I will drop down and do some of the other tasks, but if, how do I know whether I need to spend a lot more time with them or not, whether we're achieving in those three areas, not 15 or 20 tasks? Keep it simple, two to five. Okay, so then what we do is we break each of those results down into the how-tos. So that was kind of what do we need to accomplish, so we look at the three to five most important tasks. Focus now is on how. How do I achieve that result? How do I score more points? How do I achieve more the outcomes that are related to my job existence? And these must be prioritized and weighted as well. So what we do is we actually just break that down. So here's an example of that profit management key result area. 50% into five how-to tasks. And we'll take that, take that percentage, break it up. And we can see here some things are a lot more important, varying from the one, our first task is 23%, the fifth task is 2%. Now is it pretty clear, if you're hiring a sales manager, that what you believe is more important for them to be a high performer versus low important? Is it pretty clear now? Okay, now when I'm hiring, I'm not thinking about all of these aspects of the job description equally, am I? 
I'm thinking there, I see one thing up there that's almost a quarter of the job in one task at 23%, and two that are almost at 40. I better be focusing my interview on those two areas to make sure that they're performing well. And when we go back to why employees don't do what they're supposed to do, we just constructed a method that hits number one, two, and three. They don't know what to do, they don't know how to do it, and they don't know why they should be doing it. We just explained that in the result area, key result areas and critical tasks. By the way, this becomes also very important for just managing performance once they come on board, and also critically important in times of transition and succession. Who has the ball where, how important is it versus not important, when you have outgoing successors, ingoing successors. By the way, succession is, is partly hiring, right? It's putting new people in different roles. Okay, so a lot of these same principles will apply to the succession process. Okay, to rationalize it, especially when it's so emotional and with family members oftentimes, it can be very difficult. This can be an excellent tool to evaluate performance and what's more versus less important. So we add a couple more tools, like looking at what's must have, important to have, and nice to have. Okay, so again, this allows us very quickly to communicate what's expected in a role. I actually have had top performers of people at organizations. The first one was a, the first one was a controller of, a, of an organization that was being interviewed, and she put down that job track with the key result areas and critical tasks, or the, the, the CEO that was hiring her, said, this is how we define expectations here. She looked at it and she said, you know what, I've got three other offers on the table that are more money, but it's clear to me that you guys have put more thought into what you need from me than any of those other organizations. I would feel much more comfortable hiring on with you guys because I can see what you're truly expecting. The others had a hard time explaining it. Higher performers love that. It makes it nice and clear. They know how to win the game then. We look at performance that also becomes important. Um, just very quickly, just look at where this X is. Don't even try and read that. You'll see the average here. If we look at the result area number one here and we average these scores because we have a couple higher, the average would be four. But look at our two there, 23% and our 15% impact. They're not meeting expectations. So instead we like to look at performance this way. Look at those must-haves. Now in those must-haves, we're not meeting expectations, we're barely meeting them because we're appropriately weighting performance. Not everything is equal. One of the reasons we started on this process, we actually had someone who did a performance evaluation with someone. They expected to fire them at the end of it because they weren't meeting expectations. Not only did they not fire the person, but they gave them a raise. Okay, Because the information they gave them to do their job, they had actually been doing a good job of. Everything was weighted equally, and they were a good person, and so they scored really well. They were measuring the wrong things. Job analysis, what's most important to be done in the job. Okay, so now I'm guessing a lot of you are saying that's a, that's a lot. Um, this just, we're going to jump by that one. So that takes, that's going to take some effort and thought. Yes, it does. It takes about a half a day to do one position. It takes me half a day to do one position. And I've done a lot of them. Okay, it's worth it, the time, energy, and effort. Now, here's option two. This one you can, you'll, you'll be competent in in about the next 60 seconds. So our top work priorities, tool. Whoops, excuse me. Take a look at this next page, top work priorities page. So here's what I want you to do. Don't worry about whether it's a result. Don't worry about it's whether, it's, whether it's a task. Pick a position that you're gonna be hiring for and simply ask, what are the top 10 most important aspects that I need in this job? Tasks, duties, results, what do I need from this particular position? Take one of your higher performers in that particular role. Give that sheet to them. Say, okay, I'd like you to do the same thing. What we're going to do is you're going to make a list of your top ten. Then I'd like you to rank order them, number one being the most important. You could do one and only one thing in your job. What do you think is most important? And then of the remaining ones, that's number two of the remaining ones. That's number three. Then you take the same sheet of paper without looking at theirs. You do the exact same thing as the leader and manager. Write down top 10, prioritize them, one through, one through 10. Then what I'm gonna do is say, 
what's not important, by the way, don't worry about whether we have the same list or not. We won't. <laughs> okay, I've done this with hundreds of managers. You won't have the same list, I can guarantee you. That's, but that's the great thing about this. Take a third sheet of paper and say what's most important is what we decide together and what's one through ten on the third sheet of paper so that we both agree what the ten most important aspects of this particular job are and we have agreement on those. And then you have an open, honest dialogue about what are those true priorities. How many of you, if you did that, would have a better work direction and more clarity around the role than you have right now for all your positions? If you did that simple exercise. So powerful, we've seen entire dealerships turn around using this tool. I have some people now using it on a monthly basis. Once a month, they ask their employees, what are your top 10? The manager does the same thing, they sit down for 15 or 20 minutes. What do you, what do you think starts happening over time? Let's get closer and closer and closer. And then because things change, if something changes, who knows usually before something goes severely wrong? The manager, and then you can do something about it, right? Great tool, don't, uh, don't underutilize this. For the hiring process, do the same thing. So what are those things I need to make sure that we get them up to speed on a, on a very quick basis? And we have an evaluation at the end as well. There'll be a spot there to check if you'd like some of the extra slides. If you do that, we'll send you an electronic copy of that tool as well. So you can type into it. So second step. Only after we've clearly defined what the role is and how the relative importance of the tasks can we start looking at what are the factors that will predict that success now. Here we have a, a nice little cartoon here of when people are looking for, for something. This is, this is what we're all looking for, right? We're looking for someone with the wisdom of a 50-year-old, the experience of a 40-year-old, the drive of a 30-year-old, and the pay scale of a 20-year-old. Sound about right? All right, well, how do we go about finding that? All right, so three types of capabilities that we need to look at. First one, job specific. Knowledge, skills, and experience unique to performing a specific job, but not transferable to other positions. That first bullet point, what a person knows, not what they do with what they know. So this is simply another way to think about book knowledge. Okay. Just because someone is really good at taking tests in college, does that make them a great employee? No. Okay, so this is what you have in your head, not very good. Not, not how we apply it or use it. It's usually overemphasized in hiring and developing employees. Okay, significantly overemphasized in hiring and developing employees. Remember that example I read at the very beginning, who that, that general manager said we now have a preference for hiring outside our industry? He's hiring for these next factors. Okay. I get very concerned when I'm working with people and they insist on someone who has industry experience. The right person will learn that very quickly. The wrong person can have all the experience in the world but not do know what to do with it. And bring all those bad habits and baggage and ways of thinking about it. I'd much rather start with a clean slate with someone who has a ton of potential. Our transferable capabilities are ones that can be transferred to another job. Decision making, problem solving, self management, tasks management, people management, leadership, influencing. All of those are capabilities that go from one job to another. That Gemma, general manager I mentioned, that's what he figured out. What are those transferable capabilities that I can find from someone in another industry, bring them into my dealership, teach them the way I want them to think about the marine industry, and then just watch them soar. Typically it becomes more important as the complexity of the job increases. So these become absolutely critical for most positions. Now, adaptability, rapidly becoming the most single most important factor for almost all positions. Okay? Everything's changing about the industry. Everything's changing about our customers, our employees, how we work, the products. Things are constantly changing. Adaptability is rapidly becoming the most important factor. If I could hire on one factor and one factor only, it'd be how adaptable are they? The bottom line, do you think most people are highly adaptable in this world? No. Most people like change? No. 
Okay, so you find an adaptable person, grab them and hang on to them. Even if you don't have a spot for them, it won't be long before they're adding a lot of value. So there's two aspects to adaptability, willingness and ability, excuse me. Oh, excuse me, we're gonna look at those transferable first before we go to adaptability. These are just a few examples, just simply to think about, okay, when you're thinking about what capabilities are required, I know there are 12 up there. Here's what I want you to think about. Is the job more people-oriented or task-oriented first? Even if you don't get to that level of detail below, is this more of a relational job or more of a task-intensive job? Because that fundamentally goes down to the way most people are wired. It will help us understand who's a better fit or not. Again, this will be a slide that will we'll get to you. Okay, or is it some of both? Is it some of both? How many would agree service advisor might be one of the toughest positions in the dealership? Do you all agree with that? You know why? It's because it's mixed. It's both. You look at those skills, communication, problem solving, processes management, some of those things, that's what's so difficult. Find people that enjoy and are passionate about doing both on a regular basis. Other positions are much easier. If they're all task oriented or people oriented, they're easy. They're much easier to hire for. It's when you have the mixed ones that are a little bit more challenging. Okay, so our adaptability then is whether someone's both willing and able to do the job. Willingness to change, able to change, two different things. I've worked with people that are willing to change but not able. I've worked with people that are able to change but not willing. Ironically, oftentimes when we're in succession, what do we see? The next generation's willing to change but not able. They don't know the right information to change that. And the old, older generation is able to change but not willing. And we need both sides, both sides of the coin to be effective long term. Often, and that's often determines whether to develop additional skill sets. Okay, so just a quick example here. Um, flexibility, that one aspect of, of adaptability there. Franklin Roosevelt, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. A good example of even in really tough times, um, keeping a more positive, we will get through this attitude. That's more flexible. We related to adaptability, more flexible approach. Okay, versatility. Um, Warren Buffett, great example. Someone highly versatile. How many would like him managing your money? <laughs> Tends to see things other doesn't see, visionary, um, you know, simplifies complex things that others can't. Um, so someone who's very versatile. Another aspect of adaptability. Now let's look at our motivation side. So we looked at the capabilities. Can we do the job? The factors we want to look at for motivation then, our personal work style is the first one. This is personality, for lack of better term. Basic core personality. So remember earlier I said, is it more people are task oriented? Naturally, we all have that bias, that people are tasked. So it's how a person's likely to do the job, indicates whether they're naturally geared, and how they're likely to go about work based on their habits. So it's habitual responses. This is what you're thinking about without thinking about what you're thinking about. Have you ever thought about that? You all got it, I don't need to say it again, right? So what you're thinking about without thinking about, it's about thinking about what you're thinking about without thinking about it, okay? So what's that mean? It's our instinctive response, that's all it means. It's our instinctive response. It's critical because it identifies our preferred work pace and approach. Some people like to work faster and move faster, some like to move slower. Now, something that's critical is that's not efficiency. Technicians are a great example of this. You ever see technicians? If you have two technicians in the back, one of them is running around at 1,000 miles an hour. They're running to their toolbox. They're running to the parts counter. They're running out to grab something in, in a unit out, out on the yard. It looks like they're going a million miles an hour. And then you have another tech that stops, sits down for a minute, just sitting there staring at the boat. Doesn't look like they're doing a darn thing. They get up, walk over to their toolbox, walk over to the parts counter, walk back to the boat and get it done in half the time of the guy who's going 4,000 miles an hour. True or not true? Okay, so don't confuse pace with efficiency. Very different things. But it does tell us where their natural energy comes from. Also, um, a task versus people. Okay, so if we're highly people-oriented personality and we have to do a job that requires lots of tasks, okay, it's, life's not going to be very fun because it literally requires three to times 
five times the physical energy to work in an environment that's not natural to our personality. We all have to do that because we're professionals. It's called work for a reason, right? Because right? we have to do things we don't like to do. But understanding that's important. And from a hiring perspective, as managers and leaders, we want to put people into jobs that energize their natural personality, not de-energize. That's where this becomes effective. So with a little extra learning and knowledge, we can do a much better job of that. Key to also long-term personal satisfaction and predicts natural compatibility. So it becomes critical for those two things, natural satisfaction. So for example, if I'm very much a people person, extrovert, love interacting with people, how long do you think I'll be happy doing the accounting or bookkeeping job? Not gonna last very long, right? So that's an extreme example, but other jobs, we can do the same thing. Understand that. So here's an example. A couple individuals that are task oriented, would you agree? Very different styles though. Donald Trump, Bill Gates, people more focused on getting the job done. A couple that are more people oriented, Jay Leno, Laura Bush, more supportive, Laura being a more supportive individual, right? Different energy. So we see different energies relate to different fits in different roles. So you ask Donald Trump to be in a supportive role where he encouraged people and patted them on the back and asked them what they would like to do and followed their direction, how long do you think he'd be very happy? Probably not gonna last very long, would it? Okay, we're actually gonna jump over that one. Okay, now let's take a look at our work values, number five. This is related to why a person works, why they will or won't do the job, and their beliefs. How they decide what's good versus bad, right versus wrong, and critically important identifies whether a person is more self-oriented or group-oriented. Where does this become critically important? especially when we get to managerial roles, okay, right? Because if you're in a leadership role and you're responsible for a lot of people, is it more important that you're self-oriented or group-oriented? Group, right? It doesn't take very long to realize when we have a self-oriented manager, right? Things go south really quickly because they're more worried about themselves and what they get than what their employees get. So this becomes a critical factor in understanding that. So here's an example of an individual. Let's see what you think. Uh, oops. Those photos, I apologize, those photos aren't coming in like they're supposed to. Okay, so for example, we're, there we go. What do you think? So that's a picture of Madonna. Let's just see a show of hands here. Um, that came in, I'm not sure what happened to that slide. It's not working quite right. Uh, but what do you think? More me-oriented or we-oriented? How many would say more me? Pretty clear, right? <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can get this next one to work. Abraham Lincoln, more me or we? How, how many would say more me-oriented? How about we-oriented? Yeah. Okay, so it makes sense. We all know this, right? But how do we get good enough at it in the interview process to, to ferret that out? Um, what, one example of an individual I was working with, incredibly capable gentleman. Related to values, I asked this question. Tell me about the last time that you had to break a commitment that you made, or the last time you broke a commitment that you had made. And so his response was, well, uh, the job I'm leaving right now, the job before the one I'm leaving right now, I had uh, gone to work for this gentleman and committed to work for him for at least 10 years. It was on a handshake, there wasn't anything contractual, but I said, uh, yeah, I will give you 10 years, you have my word. He said about two years into the job, I got offered the job of my dreams, and so I left. And it was hard, but I just couldn't pass up that opportunity. So in the end, what did he tell me? Was he more me-oriented or we-oriented? We, me. Right? Now, is it still possible that they could have agreed to, if he was more we-oriented, is it possible he still could have left, even if he was more we-oriented? But what would he have done differently? 
he would have gone to the individual and said, hey, I made this commitment to you. I'll honor that. However, I do have this opportunity. I would really appreciate if you if you'd l- allow me out of that. But here's what I'll do because I gave you my word. Okay, so that's an example of those values type of question. We're going to get into the questioning methodology here here in a few minutes. Very telling, though. When you ask the right questions, too, people will give you an answer if you know what to listen for. It's very you can find out all kinds of all kinds of information. So the last type of last factor then, and I realize this is a lot of information to absorb right now, but is it worth continuing to learn about these areas for two to three hundred thousand dollars a year? And potential mistakes. Yeah. That's why I want to give you the foundation so you continue to learn and get better at understanding these because these is your the right people are your most important asset. So work interests, the type that's most meaningful, interesting, and motivating indicates long-term interest in a line of work, so interest and passion, provides a predictable pattern of tasks and jobs that motivate a person, that we're passionate about. What's most motivating to us, interesting, that will keep us coming back to work, where we get excited to go to work on Monday morning. So our higher interests. Equally as important are things that demotivate us, interests that we hate, that we dislike. recently was helping do a job fit for a successor. Very talented young woman. Her number one demotivator was authority work interest in a large dealership. How do you think that's going to work? She doesn't like being in charge. Had to have a pretty good conversation about what that leadership role really looks like and whether it was worth it to her or not. She's capable of doing it if she wants, but the question is, does she want to? Because she really doesn't like that aspect of the job. So we can start asking the right questions. Okay, so there are a lot of different interests here. We just look at a couple there. We have Donald Trump again helping us out here. See his top two work interests, status and economic. So I think his first one is status, right? So the question there is, if Donald had the, had the choice of looking good or making money, which one do you think he'd choose? Maybe, I don't know, maybe they'd get flipped, but I, I think they're in the right order. How about you? All right, we see Warren Buffett there, entrepreneurial and economic, right? Likes to continuously create wealth, look at opportunities that others can't see, um, and just truly loves what he does. If, but if economic, notice economic second, do you think Warren Buffett would probably work just as hard if he made $50,000 a year? Probably, if you've ever talked to him, he loves what he does. He doesn't have an expensive lifestyle. He just loves his work, that, that entrepreneurial and economic. And we see Bill Gates as well showing us that interests can change over time. Number one, previously technical, now probably more humanitarian. He's doing a lot of that work, although he's come back into the business a little bit. So maybe it wasn't quite number one. All right, Einstein, intellectual. We see Jimmy Carter, humanitarian. So there's a lot of different work interests. This becomes important. This, we're at a point now where when I'm working with other organizations, I won't recommend a hire until I learn we do some sort of an interest assessment, either through the interview or through a formal assessment. It's that important and it predicts so well whether someone's going to be a good fit for the job, whether they're passionate about doing the right things. Here's an example of all those six of those now put together in a general management role, just as far as weightings go. So you don't need to re- be able to read the slide there, but can you notice the pieces of pie are very different sizes? What that tells us is that there are different factors required to be the general manager of a smaller dealership versus a larger dealership. The way we go about hiring them, interviewing them, is very different because the factors are different. Just like the way we hire a salesperson should be significantly different than the way we hire a service manager. We should be looking at different predictors of performance in developing that job profile. So there's a, that was a, just a, excuse me, I'll come right back here. So in a fully developed, this is our model. You can use others in these same principles, but those six factors are what you need to have covered. 
And so you see here, we've gone through and we've identified this VH very high for a sales manager, versatility very high of those. We break them down, economic work interests, those three. Now, the key thing to take away from that is I don't need to hire for everything. I need to hire for three things because those are the most important. I'm going to help you see how to, how to do that for your own in just a minute. I'm guessing most of you don't have profiles that detailed. Anyone have pro profiles that detailed for hiring? No. All right, Dr. Edward Demings, quality guru, tells us if a person's not performing as expected, it's probably because they have been miscast for the job. We didn't do the right job of putting the right person in the seat because great things happen when we find the right person with the right capabilities and motivation. They don't require lots of management. They need a little coaching to get better, and then they tend to do their job on their own very well. So now let's look how do we get these people. Okay, let's get down to it. What are the principles? So we first define the job and prioritize. Look at those key areas that are must-have. Then the second thing is we looked at some of the characteristics required to achieve those. We looked at those six factors, three motivators, types of motivators, three types of capabilities. Now we need to start targeting and using the right assessment process. An interview is an assessment process. And the first one and, and the highest predictor of success is an interview. So there are a lot of other assessments we've used. As a matter of fact, this is one individual. We used 10 different assessments for this person. Um, this was for a role that was um, in a very large organization that they said they couldn't get right. By the way, for those of you that have been through an interview, this one lasted 11 hours. Okay, it was an entire day because they needed to make sure we got it right. So there are a lot of different tools we can use to get better, but the one we placed the most emphasis on was the interview because when we do that effectively, we know that that's the best predictor of success as we saw earlier with the criteria, right? Those other things just increased our success our likelihood of success. So the best predictor of future behavior is this is the most important thing for you to take from this entire session. Okay, circle it, highlight it, put stars by it. The best predictor of future behavior is our past behavior in similar situations. That's the most important principle for hiring that you can know. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior in similar situations. So when I'm interviewing, let's see by a show of hands. I'm going to give you a question. You tell me, based on that principle, whether it's a good question or not. How would you handle an upset customer? How many think it's a good question? How many don't think it's a bad question? How many are scared to raise their hand because they don't know? Okay, we've got about a third, a third, a third. All right, terrible question. Because it's totally hypothetical. How would you handle an upset customer? What are nine out of 10, if not 99 out of 100, people gonna say? Well, I would make sure and calm them down, and then I would ask them what was wrong. Wah, 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 wah. And every answer is gonna sound somewhat similar. Some will be a little bit better than others, but what did I just really just learn? Nothing. I learned that they gave me the answer that 99 out of 100 people are going to give me. I didn't find out whether they're one of the 10 or 20 percent that actually know how to handle an upset customer effectively. So instead, what I do is I use a simple principle, past behavior in similar situations. So to make it past behavior, I add two words to every question that I ever ask from now moving forward. Tell me, okay, a couple more than two. Tell me about a time when, dot, dot, dot. If you do nothing else but start every interview question with tell me about a time when, and then ask whatever question you normally ask, you will start to get better information. Now, it really gets better when you ask the second, third, and fourth probing question to find out what's going on. Okay, if I were to ask, um, you know, What's it look like to be a good people manager? Now you get a very ambiguous question. 
Here's the, here's the actual response I had to hiring a sales manager recently with the, de with the dealership. Said, tell me about the last time you effectively de developed a lower performer to a higher performer. Guy sales manager, said he's top in his field, great at turning organizations around. Said, I can't give you that example because that's not what a sales manager does high-performance sales manager does. He said, you hire people, you find out whether they work in a month or not. If they don't, you fire them and you find someone else. That's how I build a good sales team. I've done it at several organizations. And I said, thank you very much. Let's go to the next question. And I was thankful, because what did I just decide in that moment? <laughs> and he was proud of it. Okay, but I had to have a specific example. He couldn't even come up with a single person. He kind of danced around a little bit. I went back to that. I need a specific example when you've done that. Couldn't do it. That was an easier one. Okay, but still, those specific examples. I go back to tell me about a time when you had an upset customer. Okay. And so they start to tell me this, whatever it might be. Someone, someone bought a boat from us, they took it home, the battery was dead, ruined their entire weekend because they drove five hours to the lake, got there. They came back in the next day, they were irate. Okay, what specifically did you say? What did you do first? What did you do second? What did you do third? What was the impact? How do you know that to be true? If you had to do it over again, would you do anything differently? If so, what, was, what would you do differently? Now I get a story. You literally want it to be a movie. You want to be able to script a movie as to what happened. That's how much, dis how much specificity you want. In doing that, now I have a great idea as to whether they really did a good job. Without getting that level of specificity, it's going to be very difficult to know. They're just going to give me the generic answer that everybody gives me, and some will be talk faster or smile more or, or maybe like the same sports team we like or whatever it might be, so we hire them right? Versus truly looking at that. So this is the most important principle in hiring, the best predictor of future behavior, past behavior, and similar situations. It's a salesperson. Tell me about the last deal you lost. Specifically, what happened first, second, and third? And why, what, why did you lose it? Okay. Then I might ask, how often does this typically occur? Do you understand why you lost the sale? If so, Help me, help me understand why. Has this been consistent for the last five years or not? And then I'll start probing a little bit more. Okay, well, how would you explain that you've lost those sale, that sale many times? You understand what, what you need to do differently, but you haven't developed that capability yet. Now, is that going to make someone uncomfortable to ask them a question like that? Is that information I'd really like to know, though? Is that information I need to know to make sure I don't put them in a job where they fail? Okay, these questions will cause people a little more discomfort. They will squirm more. They may sweat more. Okay, they will stop and look at you and sometimes they'll think, have to think for quite a while. So you better be comfortable waiting for the answer. Just make sure you're calm. Simply say, I know these are difficult questions. Um, I understand it takes a minute, but it is important you answer the question. I'll wait. And then you shut up. And you wait. And you have to be comfortable with that. And you don't let them off the hook. Because 99 times out of 100, when you let them off the hook, all they can think of is an answer that they don't really want to give you. All right, a couple reasons. Another reason this is critical. We know it's the highest known likelihood of getting the right person. Uh, but down here, these two points. It starts to become structured. I'm going to give you a tool to structure this a little bit more in the next page or two. And that's structured, it's considered a formal assessment legally. So if you don't have a structured way of can comparing can one candidate from the next, you're opening yourself up legally a little bit. Okay, so it protects you. I actually had a client who called me not too long ago who said, David, thank you so much for giving me that tool and telling me that I should keep all my interview notes for two years. I just got a court summons from a whatever piece of paper it was from, from a lawyer that, that um, someone was alleging discriminatory hiring practices. And he said, I went to my file, I pulled it out, I had my question written, okay? 
because I had to ask the same candidates the same questions. How many of you do that? Have written questions? You have to do that, otherwise you're not comparing apples to apples. You're guessing. Okay, you gotta at least start with the same core questions related to those factors. Otherwise, every interview is totally different. It's not a valid assessment. So he looked at that, he, he, laid it on the, he laid it on the fax machine, sent it to his lawyer who sent it to the other guy's lawyer that said, this is exactly how I asked that question, and it all went away. Okay, so it's important to do that. Okay, so a couple of tips, behavior-based interview questions. What did this person actually did in situations that replicate those simulations? So what specifically did you say or do? Now, if we've taken our top 10 work priorities tool that we did earlier, right? Remember? One through 10, one through 10, one through 10, three people, we all agree. And I look at that and say, okay, let's look at this. What's required to do this job? And I make a behavior-based question off of it. Did I now just do a better job of interviewing? Yes. Okay, it's that simple. Might take a little extra time, might take a little extra thought to make sure you quack, craft the question right, but is it worth 50, 100, 200, 300 thousand dollar decision? Yeah, it is. A little extra work is worth that. How did you actually do it? So how specifically did you do that? Why did they do that? So now there's an important principle here, what's happening. The first thing we do is we find out what are the behaviors. Okay, so we want to know what happened first before I start asking the motivational question second. So did they do a good job or a bad job? I need to understand that first. And then second, what did they think about it or why did they go about doing that? I don't want to know why until I know whether they did it right or wrong. Okay, like that gentleman that, that was proud of the fact that he doesn't develop salespeople, he just hires and fires them until he finds good ones. Okay, he was proud of that. All right, impact of actions taken in these situations. So how did it turn out? Who was impacted? How do you know this to be true? If most of you did nothing but ask at the beginning of your questions, tell me about a time when, dot, 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 and then afterwards follow it up with these probing questions. Okay, so what specifically did you do? How did you do it? What was the reason for handling it that way? How did it turn out? Who was impacted positively and negatively? And how do you know this to be true? How many think you'd have way better interviews than you've ever had in your entire career? Yep. Pretty good start, a really good start. All right, so what I'd like you to do now is I'm gonna help you out here a little bit. We're gonna develop a few questions together. So I want you to start thinking about this so you can leave with a, a skill and we've applied it a little bit here. So we're looking at culture first. I want you to think about one aspect of your culture that's important to you. Is it integrity, teamwork, excellence? Um, financial success, drive, innovation, passion. Okay, I've got an example there, honesty. And I want you to write at least one behavior-based interview question right now related to what's one cultural, one aspect of your company's or dealership's culture that you need to have for them to be a good culture fit. So now we're back to those three fits, culture, performance, satisfaction. We're looking at culture first because if they're, they're not a good culture fit, it doesn't matter about the rest of it. Yeah, I'll give you a minute to think through that a little bit. I want everyone to do that because I want to get a couple examples so we can share them and also so that we can modify those okay, to make sure they're, they're good, strong questions so I can give you a few tips there. So I'll give you a minute to go ahead and, and write one or two. So I have the example there. Tell me about the last time you made a promise to someone that was difficult to keep. That's related to honesty, integrity, doing what you say, right? That's, I know that's a critical part of our culture and organization, and so that's a fair question to ask. And then I, what I'd do after that is I'd ask it the other way. Tell me about the last time you made a promise to someone that was difficult to keep and you weren't able to honor it. So what's one aspect of your, your culture? Okay, Nick and Sonia, could you help me out here with the extra microphones now? Um, so who's, who's willing to share the question that they have? Help us, help us all learn from it. 
Okay, we've got one, one gentleman right over here in the front. We'll run a microphone over to you so everyone can hear. Thank you very much. Right over here on the right. Third row, second in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dead batter. All right, just shout it. I'll repeat it. What are, so what are things you could do to encourage a strong sense of teamwork in the workplace? Thank you very much. I'm going to modify it a little bit for you to make it better, okay? So what would, is that an actual situation or is that hypothetical? Hypothetical. What do we, what's our principle? Past behavior. Tell me about the last time you did something to build a sense of teamwork in the workplace. Your question just got a lot better. It's a great starting point. Now, by the way, in interviewing, I do that sometimes too. I, I do a follow-up question and I ask it hypothetically like that and they give me a hypothetical answer and I go, oh, <laughs> and you will do this, trust me. You go, oh, I asked that wrong. So then what do you do as a follow-up? Okay, so knowing that you know how to do that, tell me about the last time you did do that. It's that easy to recover, right? Not that hard. Not that hard at all. So thank you, great question. How about another one? Yes, Rod. Great. Tell me about the last time you had a coworker who was upset with you and what you did to handle that situation. Perfect. Okay. You're going to get a pretty colorful story, aren't you? Something interesting. You're going to learn something interesting. And also helpful, especially if them being able to go along with coworkers is important which I think that is important in the workplace, right? <laughs> okay, great question. Great cultural question. What else? Yeah. When was the last time you were dishonest? When was the last time you were dishonest? Okay, that's an interesting question. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah, and she added, in this interview. <laughs> great, perfect. Yes, yes, over here. When the last time you failed? Great question. When was the last time you failed? And that, and how did you handle it? Okay, how well do they recover? Okay, tell me about the last time you failed before that. How did you handle it? What did you do? Did they, did they take their, did they take their ball and go home? Or did they double down and say, we're more energized by the fact that they don't like to, like to fail? Good question. Okay, so culture questions. What are those things you're looking for that are absolutely critical? Any others quickly? Okay, so we've got a great one uh, there. It's hypothetical, but we can, still, we can still probe into it. The question was, is the customer always right? So that's more of an attitude question. By the way, a few hypotheticals like that are okay. Okay, so is the customer always right? And then I might say, oh, tell me about the last time where you, sig you, severely, you significantly disagreed with the customer and how you handled that then, right? If they're always right and you disagreed, how did you handle it? I'm gonna go back to specific examples so I can learn a little bit more about it. Principle is so simple yet so powerful. Question is, is it worth me taking a sheet like what we have right here Writing those questions out ahead of time, taking the job description, what are the top five most important aspects, what are, let's, de let's design at least two questions for each one of the top five priorities. Take a look at what are those predictors related to their motivation and capability, what are the most important motivations and capabilities based on my understanding, and develop two or three questions for the three most important capabilities and motivators. You have way better interviews than you've ever had before. Would you agree? And the question, remember, is not whether I like doing it or whether I want to do it. Is it worth fifty to one hundred to two hundred to three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars to my dealership? Because that's the true cost of lost opportunity or risk 
that your dealership goes through every time we make a hiring decision. The next question here, we'll see if someone can just pop up, um, and then I'll open it up to some questions here, but let's see if someone can come up with a couple other ones here. So how about related to our behavior, excuse me, beha related to performance. So again, to mine performance, you might wanna just jot these in the margin right next to that work, right next to that. Resume, job description, or top priorities tool, right? That's the one we wanna use because we wanna target it towards the most important ones. Some of those transferable capabilities and adaptability. So in looking at their performance, what do they need to perform at? Those are great places to mine questions. So I'll look at an interview and I'll say, all right, Mr. All right, Mr. Johnson, I see here that um, you, you reported that you had 20% sales volume increase in your sales role every year in the last three years. That's great. Okay. Tell me specifically what you did to achieve that. Then I'll dig a little bit deeper. Okay, so you went up by 20%. What was the average the dealership went up by every year? 50%? Oh, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Those, those follow-up probing questions become important too. Again, it's a learned skill. It takes practice, it takes skills, but for 50, 100, $200,000, I can practice and get better. Interview your neighbor, interview a spouse, interview your kids, interview a coworker. When I teach a, our hiring course, we often, we role play it multiple times. I have people going back and they role play it two or three or four times because now when I'm making a hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollar decision, I really don't want to get it wrong and I've got the tools to do it right. I want to get comfortable and hone my skills a little bit beforehand. And here's the best part. The reason you, hopefully you need to do that is because you get so good at it, you don't need to do it very often. True or not true? Yeah, that's the goal. You get the right person so often that we don't need to do it very often and when we do, we really need to sharpen our skills because it's been so long. But come back to those core capabilities that we need to develop. Okay, so in thinking about performance, what's a good performance-based question you could ask? Related to a very, any role? Salesperson, technician, parts person. Yes. One of my favorite questions. Tell me about a time when you had too many priorities to possibly get done. How did you prioritize and how did you get through it? Great question. Who's a great question that's critical that I'll ask about at least five or six questions similar to that, that they need to understand multiple priorities? Service advisors, right? Got to be the best multitaskers in the dealership. And service managers. Great question there. What would be a good answer? Okay, so if I'm looking at priorities, I, wanna, I want a structured way that they're thinking about it. I want to see a method that they replicate. So a, a good answer that I've heard before, I've heard a couple different ones. Um, one of the better ones I heard was from a service advisor who said, well, what I do is I keep right here everything that I need to do every day. And I come in 20 minutes early, I write everything down, I prioritize them one through, one through whatever they are, I put a star by the ones that I absolutely have to get done by the end of the day. Okay? If for some reason something comes up that I can't get those done, I grab my service manager before I leave and I say, hey, how important is it for these things to get done before I leave? I can stay if I have to, if, if not, and they just have that conversation, usually mid-afternoon, so she can prioritize what she could, had, had to get done based also on her manager's input, not just her own so she didn't take all that risk herself. And she said, and she, and she said you know, I, I get more satisfaction not from doing the job, but putting a line through each one of those all day long. I love it and I absolutely hate the end of a day when something with a star by it's not crossed off. Someone who's that much passion and energy about getting every task, probably a pretty good person to have in a service advisor role, right? Phenomenal, be fun, phenomenal. And that's a skill set. Do, do they have to be have service knowledge to be able to do that effectively? No. If someone's good at multitasking and they bring that in, one of the places we found, interestingly enough, will have a lot of people started looking and getting some really great service advisors. Um, our wait staff, waiters and waitresses, they have to be good with people. 
They have to be good with tasks. They have to multitask. Things constantly change. They have to hold a lot of things in their head. Go find a good, go find someone who's good wait staff that doesn't want to work nights and weekends, or you do have to work weekends in this industry, but that doesn't have to work as many nights or do shift work the way they do. I've had some people find some really good transferable capabilities. So now you start finding people where you can't normally find people, right? Because we know what those capabilities are that we can transfer from one job to another. Okay, and how about a satisfaction-based question? So you've got your worksheet down there. What's a satisfaction-based question or two? And again, satisfaction, we'll go back to those motivators we talked about. Personality, values, interests. What might be a good value, or excuse me, satisfaction-based question? Tell me about one aspect of a job you've had in your past that really you, that you really enjoyed and were always passionate about doing. If you could do anything, if money weren't an option, what would you do? What job would you have? Tell me about the type of work that demotivates you most, that you just really have to grind through it and it's really hard to get done. And tell me about the last time that you had a bunch of that work you had to do and how you handled it. Tell me about the type of work where you lose, you lose track of the time, the time in the day and the last time that occurred. Where you totally lost track of, of, of time. And the next thing you knew, the day was over. What type of work is waiting for you at the dealership? Or at your, what, give me an example of this, some work that was waiting for you when you were going in to work in the morning and you're thinking, oh, I can't believe I have to do that today. People will share that information with you. And what's it telling me? Some about their interests, their passion, their, what satisfies them, what doesn't satisfy them. Tell me about the last time you were going to work and you're thinking, great, I can't wait to do this today. What exactly was that task or responsibility that you were going to take, that you're going to be working on that day? What we can do then is use that same sheet where you just wrote some of those questions. You make your own and simply do something like this. We can see here now what are those factors we're looking for that are critically important and very important. And here's the criteria we like to use. A plus means you exceed expectations. So you might want to jot these down quickly or you have them on that sheet. Plus equals exceeds, a check equals meets, a P equals partially meets, a minus sign is does not, and the question mark is I don't have enough information, I don't know. And so in this example we use multiple methodologies to, to assess this candidate. But what it allows us to do is here, if you look at this first, second column, okay, that's one interviewer. The third column is another other interviewer. We can see they had a difference of opinion. Now, in order to increase our judgment, if we've asked the same questions and targeting the same factors, and even if we had two people in the same interview, if I sit down with one of you now and say, all right, let's look at how we scored this candidate, check plus partial, and we have a conversation and come to agreement, what did we just do? Increased our likelihood of having an effective view of that candidate, right? Because we all see different things. So, but now we're comparing apples to apples. We're looking at similar type factors. I got another example here. Excuse me. Okay, similar type factors around the same question. We're just increasing our odds. Is it worth putting another person in the interview? Absolutely. For fifty or a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, I think I can adjust pulling someone off the. The, the line for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, right? There's not much that's more important for that return. Okay, so again, we're giving you the basic foundational tool, tools. Um, this, this step will give you this in, in the slides if you'd like those in an electronic format. Um, but step four, 
is the candidate development. Once we've hired someone, then we want to continue to help them get better. This should be part of your offer to candidates. Okay, where I've done my interview so well, and I'll give you an example here, that I've, here we have Jim C. What are his strengths? What are his improvement areas? Seeing those improvement areas, how are we going to improve, develop those? Who's going to help him and when? If I do that and I say, hey, all right, Jim, you're the best candidate, but you're not the perfect candidate. We still feel like you can get better at your role. We're excited about having you on board. Here are the strengths we're going to leverage, and here's how we think it's going to help us become a better organization. And then say, but there's three areas we want you to get better at. Here's how we're going to do that and the training we're going to do to help you perform at a higher level and coaching we're going to give you. Who's going to be really excited about getting that information, higher or lower performers? Higher. I've had people, again, get high, very incredibly high talent because high performers want to know that the business they're going to work for is going to help them continue to get better. How many dealerships do you think offer something like this when they're extending an offer to an employee? What kind of advantage does it do you get if you start doing that? It's a big one. I have actually had individuals say that they were extending the offer and the candidate started arguing with them over their improvement areas. You're wrong, I don't need to get better there. It's a good time to have that conversation, right, before they come on board. Okay, well, let's talk about that because what we heard was not what we see view as high performance in that role. And I just want to let you know, if you're not willing to develop in that area, this isn't the right job for you. Okay, so we better have that conversation before we go back to this offer. And we have people walk away. Okay, and the last thing then is just consider, and again, we'll get this, we'll have this slide with you, for you. Consider what other roles could they be good for? And so thinking forward. I know a lot of us aren't in really large dealerships. We can still be thinking about that. There are a lot of people that can cross over, especially if they're highly adaptable into several other roles and become much, much, much better performers. All right, so I'd like to open it up for a few minutes here. What other questions do you have about the hiring process? We covered some of the core. What's the first thing we have to do? Profile the job and what are the priorities? Second thing, what's it take to do that job well? Job predictors. Third thing, develop our behavior-based assessment questions, right? And interview questions so that we can accurately identify those. Culture first, performance second, satisfaction third. If you all do those three things, how many of you believe you will have a much better interview process than before you came to this session? Great. A couple of minutes for a few other questions. It can be something we talked about or something we haven't. Yes. The question was, would there be anything wrong using this on our current um, employees? Nope. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. That top work priorities tool, great to use. I've had people tell me it's the most the most fruitful conversation they've ever had with an employee before by each of them putting down their top 10 work priorities list and then agreeing to that third sheet of paper. Best coaching conversation they, and development conversation they said they've ever had. You absolutely use it, without a doubt. Yes? How often should you be using top work priorities? The more favorable that they're performing, the less often you need to use it. Okay, so you might be able to have that conversation once a year with a high performer. Someone who's not performing or new to the role, I want to be having that conversation a minimum monthly. Minimum. Preferably weekly. Okay, so it might be very detailed and task oriented. The more unfavorable, the more I need to follow up tightly. Okay, and communicate what the expectations are, help them get better. Good question. Yes? When would be the time for personality testing or... Mm. Those types of things. Uh, great question. Um, so we recommend doing an interview before any personality testing. We, we truly believe in that. We, use a, we have a wide variety of assessments we use. But we haven't hired anyone in 30 years without doing a personality assessment because it's so core to their natural energy. So we recommend doing a first interview, 
could even be a pre-screening. If you feel like they're gonna make it to the second level, then we'll do it at that point. Now, if you're using any form of assessment, background check, anything else, make sure you use it exactly the same spot in the process for every candidate so you don't open yourself up for any sort of discrimination lawsuit. Okay, because if I, one person, if it's a, I interview three men and I don't do it, and then I interview someone who's a, who's a woman and I do just because I, I whatever think that she's gonna be the best candidate and the other guys aren't, it doesn't necessarily look good, right? Okay, in any protected class or whatever it might be, just make sure you do it at the exact same spot in the process. Don't just randomly do it or one guy, that one guy comes in and you think he's a little bit weird so you do the criminal background check on him and then you find out later on he's, he's from some sort of uh, um, whatever, believes you discriminated against him in some way, shape or form, but you're the only one you did that particular background check on. Just write the check, don't go to court. Save yourself some time. <laughs> yes. Yes, so the question was, do you use the same set of questions for the, sa for the same candidates, for the same job? Yes, absolutely. That's the nice thing. Once you get it done for a salesperson, you have it done for a salesperson. Put on the photocopy machine, just use them over and over again, or fine tune them to make them even a little bit better. That's the way you compare apples to apples. If you have, no, so what if you have multiple people interviewing, and that's where um, if you get to kind of that next level of interviewing, what we'll do is we'll say tasks management. Okay, so as an example, is, is something important for a service advisor? So we have a question bank of 15 questions related to task management. So if, if Rod, you and I are interviewing them, I'll say, Rod, you take one through three, I'll take four through six, and that should give us a good idea what their task management capabilities are, so then we're coming back to the factor. We just didn't have time to teach quite that level today. Well, we're getting you good, 70% there, that last 30%, there's another suite of tools that really help you fine tune. But what you guys have today, those three things will get you leaps and leaps and bounds. Yes, and then down in front. What about using social media as a background check? I honestly don't know. Um, I've heard pros and cons for that. Um, I personally, in the interview process, would wanna be more conservative and not finding out information I don't wanna know. I know a lot of people su significantly disagree, but I can learn all sorts of things I may not wanna know about someone on social media, and that isn't relevant. As a rule of thumb, what I need to know is can the, does the person fit with my culture? Can they perform the job at a high level? And I wanna make sure that everything I do in the interviewing process is information that helps me make those decisions and is legal and might not, I might not see, find information I don't necessarily want to know. Other people will say it's in public domain. You can go ahead and do that. As far as legally in the courts, it's up in the air. No one really knows whether you should or shouldn't or if you're opening yourself up for liability. So honestly, I can't, I can't tell you, give you a firm opinion on that. Yes. Okay, he asked if we have questions. We, we do. Um, we've actually spent several hundred thousand dollars developing those, so they're not free, sorry. But yes, we do, we have question banks and we have the profiles for specific jobs yep, available. Yeah, resources for personality tests and quizzes, yes, those are also services we provide and also can point you towards other vendors that provide those. Okay, there are a lot of different ones there. Yep, oh. and if you use some, we can also tell you what they do and don't Me measure because there are a couple out there that are used a lot right now and there are a lot of false positives because people don't understand what it truly does and doesn't measure. When you're doing uh, personality profiles, uh, do, you, do you calculate those results at that moment in front of the interviewee or do you do no. that later and then? No, we don't calculate the results in front of the, that we would have them do it either at the end if it's a paper and pencil assessment, what we'll do is we'll actually give it to them and have them just go through the and do their scores, and then we'll we'll actually generate the results after they're done. Yeah, I don't do it with them. Okay. So I'll I'll stay for a few more questions, but what I want to do is wrap up because I know we're up against um, time. Um, 
Remember those five steps? The first three are the most critical. Let's get our priorities, either by using job tracks or that the top work priorities tool. Then we want to look at what are the factors that predict job success, those motivators and capabilities. And lastly, assess the job holder against a culture fit, performance fit, and satisfaction fit. Okay, you do those two things and ask, use what principle? What's the single most important principle for interviewing that we all learned? The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior in similar situations. So in front of every one of our interview questions, if we do nothing else, put, put the words, tell me about a time when, you'll be a much better interviewer. And as a result, we'll be one of these people. Peter Drucker, one of the greatest management thinkers of the last century, as he said, the ability to make good decisions regarding people represents one of the last reliable sources of competitive advantage, since very few organizations are very good at it. You all have some tools that will take you leaps and bounds from where you are before we started here. It's worth the time. It's worth the effort. Please use them. If you have questions, give us a call. Otherwise, I look forward to hearing about your successes next year. So thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>